Senior Executive Service Induction Ceremony in honor of Mr. John H. Stoneberg. The host for today's ceremony is the Chief of Staff of the Army, General Randy A. George. Please stand for the singing of the National Anthem by Staff Sergeant Maya Rodriguez of the United States Army and Pershing Zone and remain standing for the invocation delivered by Chaplain Major General William Green, Jr. <coughs> Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave well done. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen please join me in prayer as we ask god's blessings upon this momentous occasion let us pray Almighty and everlasting God, we are truly grateful for the opportunity to gather together this morning to celebrate this well-deserved honor and achievement. We pray for your special blessing upon today's ceremony as Mr. John Stoneberg continues his commitment to serve this nation and her people through leadership in our army. In your wisdom, you provide our nation with leaders who stand for what is right, honorable, and true. Mr. Stoneberg's dedication and selflessness have made him exactly the kind of leader since we have known him as he answers the call. Heavenly Father, may your gracious hand continue to endow him with wisdom, courage, and perseverance as he fills this role as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for military personnel and quality of life. Sustain him, his wife Nicole, and their family in the days ahead with a new sense of your presence and support. And now, Lord, we pray that your strong arm will continue to enrich our great nation, empower the United States Army, and protect our service members and families, especially those in harm's way. We ask all these blessings in your name. Amen. Please be seated. The Senior Executive Service, commonly referred to as SES, is made up of the men and women charged with leading the continuing transformation of government. These leaders possess well-honed executive skills and share a broad perspective of government and public service commitment, which is grounded in the Constitution. The keystone of the Civil Reform Act of 1978 was the designation of the SES as a corps of executives selected for their leadership qualifications, not their technical expertise. Members of the SES serve in key positions just below the top presidential appointees and alongside general officers and are the major link between these appointees and the rest of the federal workforce. Ladies and gentlemen, General George. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? I'm looking around. We got a whole bunch of uh, G3 in here. We got a whole bunch of the G1 in here. I'm wondering who's doing any work back, <laughs> in the, um, back anywhere. So um, I'll make sure to tell the G3 that this doesn't count on your clock. Everybody's got to add a little bit of time. So um, 
real honor. I was just was talking with uh, with Michelle Talley before coming down here, and um, she had said she hadn't seen a chief staff of the Army that had ever done uh, an SES induction ceremony. So um, she'd been around a couple of days, and a real honor for me to do that. And um, just what I've done, I'll talk a little bit about John, but all that our SESs do for our Army um, and all the impact that they have across the Army and what they can do to help us um, transform and change and make sure that our Army stays ahead of everybody else uh, across the globe here. Um, and we've got a great example of that um, with, with John. So I really appreciate everybody being here. I think this is a special, special day. And I know it's a special day for John. Um, getting ready to induct him into the SES ranks. 33 years ago today, he enlisted in the Army. 33 years ago. So thank you for 33 years of amazing service. You got 33 to go. Um, <laughs> so I'm, John's just a great professional. Um, I'm happy for you. Um, I'm happy for Nicole and your family, but I'm most happy for the Army because I know you're going to continue to make a big um, make a big impact. So I want to kind of go around and everybody knows um, in the military and John's had other promotions and uh, I think all of us who've whether you're an SES or a senior civilian, you know you don't get someplace without a whole bunch of help um, and support along the way. And John's probably needed a little bit more than most, right, Nicole? <laughs> um, so John and Nicole have been married since uh, 2007. And we were just talking that, the, you know, he said, you know, not that long, 17 years. And I'm like, all right, John, we're getting old. That's been a couple of days. Um, and they met in a very military romantic way. So uh, John and Nicole were both getting ready to PCS away from then Fort Bragg, now Fort Liberty. And so they were together at a PCS briefing. Um, and so I'm, I'm told here, I found out a little bit more details on this um, this morning, that uh, John um, was able, he said he stalked her a little bit, was able to find her email address on her paper and and get in contact with her so you're quite the charmer John um, but anyway I appreciate that's that same kind of same kind of persistence um, and knowing what he wants that uh, that I saw down in FM but uh, I know Nicole has been your biggest supporter so Nicole was a army nurse or not I'm sorry she's wearing army green today but she was at the time was an Air Force um, nurse, tro chose to retire as a lieutenant colonel, come up here, um, be with John, keep the family um, together. And I, like I said earlier, Nicole, I know it's no overstatement. We've known you for years as well. Um, all that you've done to support John and, and the family and raise a wonderful family. So John and Nicole have a small family. I'm going to list and there's a couple of them that are here with them today. Haley, 29, is a nurse. Heidi, 28, veteran right now, getting his transition, in the middle of transition. Hillary, 26, is a school teacher. Elliot, who's up here with us, is uh, 14. John and Jaina are up here, who I remember talking about when I was down in Demo FM, um, are, are eight. Um, and, you know, this is, I don't know what the, how much extra money your dad makes, but I would imagine your allowance will go up a little bit. <laughs> just, a, just a little bit. So, you could write, you can write that down. Um, and I know um, beyond John and Nicole uh, and Heidi, there's a family uh, a legacy of service. So, John's father, also John, and we've got John the fifth that's down here. Spent 31 years in the Navy and retired as a chief petty officer. He and John's mom, um, Claudine, have passed, but I know, um, John, that they're looking down on you and are very, very proud for all that you've done for our Army and our nation. So we also have some other supporters that are here. you got Sister Sharon and her husband, Jeff. Thank you for being here. Brother Anthony. Where's Anthony? Good to see you, Sergeant Major. Retired Command Sergeant Major and his wife, Wendy Ann, who's still a major in the reserve. So anybody I say here that doesn't have something military behind them, I want to see you afterwards this <laughs> evening. Well, starting with nephew Brandon and his fiance, Suhani. All right, so we can see you right back here about you looking. <laughs> um, nieces, Brittany and Gracie back there. Great to see you and great. Um, Thank you for all that you've done for John and Nicole 
and supporting him through, through the years. So I mentioned 33 years. Um, John has served in the Army in about every possible way. I'm going to name one, you know, exception. Um, but started off um, 33 years ago enlisting in the Army, was an NCO in the Rangers, then was a commissioned officer um, as a mili in military police, and then when I got to know John um, as an Army uh, civilian. And unfortunately, I think this promotion takes you out any possibility from getting into the warrant officer ranks and batting, <laughs> and bat and batting the complete cycle. Um, I've known John since 2015, and we were just reminiscing um, about some of those stories when I became the director of force management um, down in the G3. And I can tell you that uh, his expertise, his teamwork, his leadership, his intellect um, were apparent to me um, almost immediately. And John, you know, I've been one of your biggest fans um, ever since. So anybody who knows what goes on in force management knows there's no such thing as a fun or easy decision um, when you get done. And typically when you're, you're finished, there's another tough one that um, comes behind it. But any good idea that anybody has, and we were together, and I know John through the years has seen a lot of good ideas, but one good idea, one place, requires a cut um, in, in some other location that you're going to have to deal with. And so... Um, during our time together, I know John developed options to execute the decision that we had because the Army was coming down to 450 at the time. Um, we had to cut two brigade combat teams, and John worked all those options um, and pissed a whole bunch of people off <laughs> along the way. So, um, And then um, working all the options with General Milley to create the Security Force assistance brigades, which was also very, very exciting. So I know uh, John's been trusted by every single FM director, and I've known a bunch of them um, ever since, an Army G3 to manage the most complex, complex aspects of our force structure. Uh, I think what's amazing about John is um, all, a lot of the decisions that come up into the Pentagon are complex. They're hard to understand, and I think that uh, the real um, what essence of, of greatness up here is being able to take really complex situations, really complex problems, and break them down into really uh, understandable and concise way that everybody can kind of get on board with that. And John, you have a, a really, really special talent with that. And because I knew John had a special talent with that, I used to come back um, there was a whiteboard outside of his office, and uh, John may still have some scar tissue with that, but we, I made him spend a lot of time, and I came back to that whiteboard all the time to, you know, when I was coming on board, and I want to thank you for all that you did um, at that time to, to bring me on board. There were a couple of times that I went back there and I couldn't find John, and I was convinced that he was around the corner or somewhere hang, <laughs> hiding from me. Um, <laughs> So I know you're going to do great things um, in MNRA, John, and um, you know, and everybody else in here who's in MNRA, and you've been over there for a couple of weeks, is all those things that you do inside the MNRA and inside the G1, you know, directly affect um, soldier and family well-being across the um, across our formation. So um, I want to. I know you're going to be great there. I want to give give you just a couple of. Uh, words of wisdom here since you gave me so many through the years. Um, and now that you're at the SES level, I'd ask that you keep three things in mind. First, don't let the process or the bureaucracy confine you. Continue to do what's right for our formations and for our soldiers and families. Two, act with the same sense of urgency you had as a uniform leader and as you did when you were in FM. The world is volatile and dangerous. I think everybody in here knows it, and it requires us to be bold to transform for the future. And then three, please take the time to mentor and grow the talent we'll need in the future. I know you have a ton to offer all those rising civilians, and I think that's one of our biggest duties as leaders is to make sure that we are creating the generation um, that's following us. And as I mentioned, because you have given me so much advice, I want to give you the same advice that I give um, to general officers because uh, I, it's the same thing, and you can remember looking back and you had to go see an SES and being a little bit anxious um, about those kinds of things and the, the scope and breadth of the things that you're going to solve. Um, first is be positive in every interaction. 
Um, if you can remember, there's times where you only met those very senior leaders one time. They will remember the one time that they are interacting with you. So be positive in your interaction. It doesn't mean you don't, you shouldn't say what needs to be said, but be do it in a positive way. Second is remember how your decisions are going to impact our formation. Every de every decision that you're going to make up there in some way, shape, or form. It's not for anybody inside this building. The things that we do are all about our formations um, that are out in the across Conus and really around the world. And third is have fun. I think we want everybody to see um, there's a lot of tough days in here, a lot of grind. I saw you do that down in FM. We're going through it, always having a smile on your face. And I think that's a critically important example um, to share with everybody else. So um, I'm proud to be a part of this, um, John. I know everybody in here who has um, ever served with you, um, even for a couple of days, um, knows uh, what a great leader you are. And uh, it's great to welcome you into the SES ranks today. Thank you, General George. Mr. Stoneberg, Mr. Stoneberg, would you please join General George in front of the flags? <laughs> Got a little sick. General George will now administer the oath of office. Okay, I'm going to read the initial part because this is a pretty long title. <laughs> Okay, raise your right hand, repeat after me. I state your name. I, John Henry Stoneberg IV. Having been appointed. Having been appointed. The Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army. The Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army. For military personnel. For military personnel. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. And I'll bear true faith. I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the same. And allegiance to the same. I take this obligation freely. I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. For purpose of evasion. For purpose of evasion. And that I will well. That I will faith, well and faithfully, and faithfully discharge the duties. Discharge the duties of the office upon which I'm about to enter. Of the office upon what of which <laughs> on which I'm about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, General George. Mrs. Stoneberg will now present the SES pin to Mr. Stoneberg. The symbol of the SES pin and flag represents a keystone, the center stone that holds all stones of an arch in place. This represents the Senior Executive Service's critical role as a central coordinating point between government's political leadership and the line workers who implement it. The upright lines in the center of the keystone represent a column in which individual SES members are united into a single leadership core. Thank you, Mrs. Stoneberg. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our newest member of the Senior Executive Service, Mr. John H. Stoneberg. Uh, thank you, everyone. I left my nine-inch binder at home <laughs> to, uh, to not make this a long one. Uh, but I, I do want to offer thanks to everybody who helped me get here. They say it takes a, uh, a village to, to raise an idiot. For me, it took a metropolis. <laughs> and, uh, and so I will talk about my metropolis and all the folks in concentric circles who have uh, helped me get to where I am. But I would like to start off with, with, sir, thank you very much. I probably would not have done this ceremony if you were not able to do it. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a second, about how I got here or how I started my path. And I really do appreciate everything you've done for me in, in hosting the ceremony. Um, also want to thank your exceptional protocol office. They made this so easy. Um, the uh, ARDF providing all of the refreshments in the back I, after we made some cuts to their organization. But um, <laughs> hopefully none of the food is poisoned. The, uh, but that's, that's the tough decisions of, of, the, of life in FM. So um, 
so I want to talk about my metropolis. And for me, it's, it's circles, right? So for me, the inner circle is, is my family. And it starts with my wife, Nicole, my six children, the, the three H's, and then uh, Elliot, uh, John, and Jaina. And, and they're the ones that really have to suffer when I'm coming home late or, or I had a bad day and I was a little grumpy or, or something. And, um, and I appreciate everything you've done to, to keep the family going. I 100% could not have done it without you. Um, obviously, wouldn't be here without my parents. I, I find it a little ironic that now I'm on the E-ring, and if I walk across the hall, I can actually see where they're buried in Arlington. It is, uh, it is pretty cool. I don't have a window yet, but I can walk across the hall, <laughs> and I can look out that window. Uh, and then my siblings, so starting with my oldest brother, Michael, uh, I, I remember, so he, he joined the Army in 1988, 80, no, 86, 87. I don't remember. It was a long time ago. <laughs> um, but uh, when he started, I, I wanted to be a soldier since I was probably six years old. And I knew I wanted to jump out of airplanes and shoot things. I've cleaned that up over the years. It used to say some other things. But uh, so seeing my oldest brother start off, uh, we quickly learned the Army was not for him. He doesn't like being told what to do. Uh, <laughs> so followed by my other brother, uh, who also joined and served. And so for me, the Army was the only logical choice. And I appreciate you, know, you guys having to, to deal with me. I, I know I was a little bit of a pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> hence. <laughs> Hence my nickname when I was growing up, which was PITA, and you can do the acronym in your head. So, but uh, I, I definitely want to thank my family. They're, they're my inner, inner circle of my metropolis. So then we get to the second circle of my metropolis, and, and, it, and there's some, it's funny because so many people in my career have actually know each other, and I just find it you know, remarkable that the Army is such a small family. So my first squad leader, Rick Merritt, uh, retired as the 8th Army Command Sergeant Major, uh, phenomenal, phenomenal infantryman. Just taught me everything there was to know about in placing an M60 machine gun, and I was lethal because of him. And then I fast forward a couple years, and I run into Matt Hellrung, uh, also known as Lord Vader, <laughs> as my platoon sergeant. And it turns out that him and Rick Merritt were in the Third Ranger Battalion together when they were young soldiers. And so uh, I was not surprised that when the best leadership I got at that young non commissioned officer level came from Matt. And so my goal today is to make Lord Vader cry. Um, I will probably not be successful, but I do have a couple things I wanna say. So Matt taught me, truly taught me, hard right over easy wrong at every single opportunity. Do not ever compromise your integrity. And I have taken that with me my entire career. And I want to point out, he sacrificed his career because of integrity, because he would not compromise. And that example is, is no better said than, than you making that hard right over the easy wrong because people were doing wrong. And I have, that has stuck with me my entire career since, I, since you left the platoon. And by the way, the most lethal platoon, uh, hiding behind sequoias in the middle of the uh, you know, desert out at NTC and, and doing training when everybody else was sleeping in the fart sack, we were training. So uh, Matt, I appreciate everything you've done for me. And I 100% I guarantee you people came back from Iraq because of your leadership. So that, that kind of closes out my second loop other than a, a gentleman I could not get in touch with, um, Sergeant Major retired Mike Collins. Uh, he, when I was a young, young sergeant before I met Matt, literally grabbed me by my neck, walked me down to the education center, threw me in a chair and said, enroll him in college now, I don't care what he says. <laughs> and, and had he not done that, I promise you I would not be here today and I really wish I could get in touch with him, but uh, you know, Jeff, we tried and we were just not able to find him. So someday I will, I will link back up with him and, and say the appropriate things. So my, my, my third loop is after I became a commissioned officer, and there's, there's three people that were kind of influential in my, my development as a leader. Uh, first one was Bobby Atwell. Uh, some of you know him, and, and you know, he is the proverbial duck, very calm, very even keel. I don't know what his feet were doing, uh, but that man taught me how to be a leader without having to you know, dismember people. Um, so a little bit different leadership between the infantry world and the military police world, and, and Bobby helped me make that transition very well. Uh, and then uh, working for General Quantock when he was a brigade, brigade commander, and we walked into the mess known as Abu Ghraib. And the lessons I learned from that experience are tremendous. And it all comes down to one thing, and it is leadership and taking care of soldiers. And back to Matt, choosing the hard right over the easy wrong. Right? It was very, very simple. And we had to clean up that mess. And it was terrible. It was a terrible experience for our Army. But I, I sat there and watched as, as you know, then Colonel Quantock making the right decisions to take care of soldiers. And, and me as his weapon, the S1, making sure soldiers were getting paid and getting awards and, and getting the things they needed. 
And then the last one from, from my third ring is Jerry Stevenson, sitting over here to my left, and I really am, am very appreciative that you were able to make it. My battalion commander in Iraq, I literally could not have asked for a, bata a better battalion commander. Let me do the things that I wanted to do as a commander and lead my company and put me in possibly the worst possible location in Iraq. <laughs> where we were getting rocketed and mortared every night at Fob Kalsu. If anybody knows about Fob Kalsu, it's a wonderful little hellhole south of Baghdad. But uh, what he taught me was how to lead leaders and let leaders make decisions. And I inherited a company with a tremendous amount of combat veterans. We were talking last night, probably 90% of them were on their third or fourth deployment. And he taught me how to lead leaders. And I'm very appreciative of that because I think that helped me make the transition to the next phase of my career. And then I followed him to Korea for some reason. Um, that was the Army and Air Force's means of joint domicile. Nicole came here, I went to Korea. <laughs> so to my fourth loop, and there's only six, and then 47 subparts, so it won't be too much longer. Um, then I came to the Pentagon, and I learned how to be a staff officer. And I, I have some folks here, and in no particular order. So Deb Spinagle was my first branch chief in the Pentagon. Uh, the proverbial say no, and then when they come back, they'll give you what they really want. Uh, but, but really taught me how to be a, a good action officer and get that, the point across in 15 lines. And, and it, it stuck with me ever since, is you gotta be concise, senior leaders do not have time to read five pages, just be concise. Uh, Larry Sproul, former member of the FM community, also known as one of the two curmudgeons, and I'll get to the next one next, um, but uh, taught me about being a good staff officer and, and attention to detail, and I wish Larry could have been here, but it's, uh, yeah, very appreciative of what I learned from him. And then third, the other curmudgeon, Randy Tibbs, and anybody who knows FM knows Randy Tibbs. And as we like to joke, he declined my assignment to the G3 three times. <laughs> I was a junior major, I can't fault him. Um, but I, I do wanna say thank you, Randy. I've learned a tremendous lot from, a lot from you over the last 15 years. And anybody who thinks Randy and I did not like each other because we like to argue back and forth, I promise you that is not the case. We get along. That is just how we communicated to each other and worked through problems. Um, um, I will refrain from other comments. Uh, my, uh, my first division chief, Ben Rivera, uh, I remember while walking into his office and he sat me down. He's like, okay. He's like, you're a major and you're going to be in a room representing the G3, so don't let those colonels bully you. I was like, okay, sir, you probably should not have said that to me, of all people. <laughs> so um, be prepared for a lot of phone calls and angry mail, e emails, which he got a couple of them from Forcecom. Uh, but I am very appreciative of what, what he taught me when I first got to the Pentagon and the tour he gave me as he was uh, one of the casualty assistance mortuary affairs officers after 9-11. And so he gave a really good perspective on what it means to serve in the building. Uh, the last four, uh, the division chiefs in FMF that I uh, worked with very closely, so Bob Hughes, Mike Musso, Mike Tokar and Pete Patterson. Uh, whether you realize it or not, I learned a lot from each of you and I took away the way you handled things all very differently and it now incorporated into my kit bag. So that gets to my fifth loop. And, and my fifth loop was the group of individuals who really got me to, to learn how to be an executive and get to where I am today. And so this is in no particular order. Um, Miles Mimasu, who is not able to make it today a, a great mentor. He actually was on the hiring panel for my GS-15 position um, and immediately said, hey, we got we to start talking about the next level. And I was like, okay, this, this is great. Uh, and that was a long, long road, I promise you, long road with lots of mentorship. This is the biggest part of my metropolis. Um, Steve Stoddard, greatly appreciate everything you did for me. Uh, Tom Cook sitting right next to him as well. Uh, a lot of things. Uh, Mike Mahoney, finally got me the decoder ring on how to write ECQs. Um, so I was greatly appreciative of that. Uh, Bob Steinerhoff and in, in, uh, in all the things that we've done over the last 10 years in, in the force management realm and, and dealing with the faces and the spaces and, and the torturous outcomes of a lot of that, uh, but trying to do the right thing for the Army. And Robin Mueller watching her as the first FMF chief when I got to the Pentagon years ago, 15 years ago. Um, uh, I appreciate everything that I have uh, learn from watching you. And there, there's three I want to recognize a little distinctly because they were the ones that got me over the goal line at the very last. They pushed me from back. And uh, so first one is Miss Diane Randon. Um, for long story short, I, I did not do so well in an interview, I, my, my observation. I went to her, uh, you know, hat in hand and asked for some vice, advice and, I, and it worked. I, it just started clicking and I really appreciate you taking the time out to, to help me get through that last, that last hurdle. 
Um, other one is Mr. Dan Klipstein, uh, same thing. And then last, lastly, Dr. Brian Schoen. The, the three of them kind of helped me get over that last hurdle. And I am immensely appreciative uh, of, of you taking the time and the two of them helping me get through that last part. So the last loop, um, a little different for me, is, is all of the younger soldiers that I have served with over time. And I, everybody knows I like to tell stories. I like to listen to stories. And I take away from what you are saying, whether you realize it or not, and I learned from that because what you tell me typically is about bad leaders you've had and great leaders you've had. I want to avoid the bad stuff. I want to incorporate the good stuff. So I'm only going to mention a few. A couple of them are sitting back there. So Lieutenant Colonel Kate Smith, uh, John Oliver, her, the one who had her job before her, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dwayne Bowden, uh, Colonel Josh Woodruff, uh, I think he's, uh, he'll be a Lieutenant Colonel soon, Joe Kanga, and then uh, Latoris Williams back there. Just one of a few. I have just enjoyed listening to your stories and the trials and tribulations of the leaders you have had. And I've tried to incorporate the good things and stick it in my kit bag. And so I'm very appreciative. And, and my, my closing, so my metropolis has really given me, I think, a good moral compass. And now that I'm transitioning from spaces to faces, I, I'm hoping that it will put me in a position where I can do the best things for our soldiers. Because at the end of the day, whether it's a hard decision, a good decision, a bad decision, it's I'm trying to make the right decision for the right reasons. And all going back to Mr. Matt Hellrung, who is not crying, <laughs> but choose that hard right over the easy wrong for, for the, all the right reasons. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Stoneberg. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the singing of the Army Song by Sergeant Rodriguez. The words to the Army Song can be found on the back of your program. March along, sing her song, with the Army of the Free. Count the brave, count the true, who have fought to victory. We're the army and proud of our name. We're the army and proudly proclaim. First to fight for the right and to build the nation's might. And the army goes rolling along. Proud of all we have done, fighting till the battle's won. And the army goes rolling along. And it's high, high, hey, the army's on its way. Count off the cadence loud and strong. For where we go, you will always know that the army goes rolling along. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's ceremony. Please join in congratulating Mr. Stoneberg and his family in the receiving line. They invite you to join them for a reception in the back room of the Hall of Heroes. Thank you and have a good evening.